Hi everyone, I'm here with my Kino, nope, wrong, <laughs> that's what I just did, I just did my Kino haul and now I have some indicator titles and then I also have just like a stack of Blu-rays here, um, technically one's a 4K release, but some random titles that I've gotten from Best Buy and Target at various times. <laughs> if you've been watching, if you watch the Criterion haul video and the Kino haul video, you'll know that I'm just filming all of these like right in a row. And for some reason, I just like am having some difficulty like speaking and reading today, just very tongue tied. So warning slash apologies in advance. Also, this is an instance where the indicator titles I have not watched yet and don't know that much about, but I have seen all of the these other titles here. They were almost all rewatches anyway when I bought them and subsequently watched them after purchasing. So um, yes, here we go. The Indicator Sale. All of these, by the way, I'll just mention now in case I forget, they're all the limited edition Blu-rays. So we're gonna start with the two that I knew I was going to get for sure. I mean, I only purchased four titles, but that's because shipping is like a lot. So um, although now they are going to have, like, a U.S.-based store, right? Um, I'm pretty sure that was announced. I'll start with Eve, or Eva. I think it's it's known as both. I'm really not sure which title I should say. The alternative cover art says Eva. Sorry, you, can you see it very well? Probably not. This is so awkward to hold. <laughs> um, I, I keep going back and forth, too, on if I want to switch the cover around. Oh my gosh, this is another Joseph Losey film. I literally just was talking about him. Cool. Eve. I'm just gonna call it Eve. Is this French? Wait. <laughs> I realize I don't know anything about this. It's just the cover was very intriguing and I have seen... I was aware of this just because I think I had seen it on like random letterbox lists of something in particular, but I don't know what. Um, but also maybe I was just looking at Jean Moreau's page on Letterboxd and I saw it and I was like, what's that? <laughs> and then also maybe when I was on Joseph Losey's Letterbox page, I was like, what's that? So I got it and it's based on the novel by James Hadley Chase, which I don't think is very easy to find. I don't remember. I've been looking up a lot of books lately. I bought so many books this year, you guys, but a lot of them have been used. So that's okay with me. A lot of books, okay? <laughs> yeah, so it stars Jean Moreau and Stanley Baker. I love Jean Moreau. Oh, and I the facts don't even say anything about what it is about, so I didn't even think about that. On the back of this part here, it says, they called her the eighth deadly sin, the La Dolce Vita of Venice, a fringe life of play and play pleasures, men seeking new kinds of thrills, and a woman who knew how to give them every abnormal thrill they wanted. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm realizing I don't know what to say, but I do, I did, I was like, is this French or English? It's probably in English. But I was questioning it because of Jean Moreau. And then I was like, wait a second. I do think I've seen her in a movie that was in English though. Or maybe I just watched, maybe I watched the trailer for this and I don't remember. We're off to a great start, okay? Great. <laughs> um, by the way, this is region B only, so I have to watch it downstairs because that's where the region free player is. Yes, then the other title that I knew I was going to get is Secret Ceremony. Oh yeah, wait, these have spine numbers. So Eve is spine number 191. Yes. And then this is spine number 155. And this is also, again, the limited edition Blu-ray, also Region B. And this is another, it's, I think it's another Joseph Losey film. Where is the director? <laughs> Directed by Joseph Losey. Produced by John Heyman and Norman Priggin, I think. Starring Elizabeth Taylor, Mia Farrow, Robert Mitchum. Great. Just like those three. Great already. I just know that I was interested in them based on the stars based on the director. And is this possibly an adaptation based on the original short story by Marco Denevi? Oh yeah, this is one that I tried looking up and couldn't find at all. So I was like, it's fine, I'll just watch it. 
Because of the unusual ending, no one will be admitted during the last 12 minutes. I didn't even read that on the back until now. Okay. Okay. <gasps> Mia Farrow, more haunted than in Rosemary's Baby. You have me. You have me. Oh, I'll show you the alternative artwork. They're kind of pretty similar. I don't know. I'll just stick with the purple, I think. I do know that the alternative alternative artwork is only for the limited editions, though. From what I can remember, it's like the booklets and the other artwork that is the difference between limited and standard editions. Correct me if I'm wrong. And then this one is actually region free. So it says A, B, and C, and that is Immaculate Conception, written, produced, and directed by J Jamil Delavi, starring Melissa Leo and James Wilby. And I watched the trailer for this and I was intrigued because of the plot, but also intrigued because of the way that these characters were sort of integrating themselves into the culture there. And I couldn't tell if it was like cringy in terms of I hate that word now it's being so overused I hate absolutely hate it rephrasing um I couldn't tell if it was like ooh yikes <laughs> I love that that's my rephrasing ooh yikes I couldn't tell if it was like ooh yikes these you know in the way of like white people going to impoverished countries or areas of impoverished countries um and Although, I feel like that's rude of me to say impoverished countries. But, you know, like, when people go places and then it's like, are you helping, really, though? I don't know. That's just my opinion. Okay. Let's let's not get too into that, I guess. But she really wants to have a baby. Well, uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Melissa Leo and James Wilby, they're ma a married couple. And they are visiting, I think, somewhere in India. I should look it up. Um, I did watch the trailer, which is why I know partially what this is about. Um, and she becomes pregnant, I'm pretty sure. And then she that's something that she was like really trying, she was trying to get pregnant and she kind of went by route of, I don't know what the right term is. I Like voodoo, but not voodoo, because obviously it's like a different culture, but sort of that sort of spiritual way of trying to become pregnant and using those sort of remedies to get pregnant. They were strangers in a foreign land, a place where anything could happen, even miracles. But I'm pretty sure like the director is from the country that they're visiting. So that also made me curious as to how much it would seem like they were sort of like the white savior kind of characters um, thinking that they're doing good in another country or if they were really being appreciative and being interested in the culture that they were becoming involved in and trying to learn about and such. You know what I mean? The Unfortunately, the alternative artwork here is literally just the same cover. I don't know if that's a mix-up on, like, perhaps my specific copy, like, an error occurred. The only difference is, like, the alternative artworks have, like, the uh, UK rating symbols, which are annoying. People in the UK, do you guys get annoyed by that? I get annoyed by it. <laughs> I am going to look in the inside really quickly. Oh, with English language with Urdu. Urdu? I don't know. U-R-D-U. Is it Indi- I... Second guessing the India thing. The India thing? Okay, Bailey. <laughs> ah, yeah. Okay, it's Pakistan. That's what I was thinking. But then for some reason I second guessed myself. French Pakistani director Jamil... Telavi, Delavi, I should pronounce that more like a D, sorry. Uh, the film is set in 1988. Should I have done this for all the movies? Maybe. It's too late. <laughs> the film is set in 1988, a tumultuous year in the troubled history of Pakistan, a nation that was carved out of undivided India, sundering a glorious culture into three, Pakistan, India, and East Pakistan. By the way, East Pakistan is now Bangladesh. Uh, in a bloody part partition orchestrated by British colonial masters in 1947. Uh, the schism caused by 
partition is still felt in all three nations more than 70 years after the event. The fact that it happened on religious grounds dividing mu Muslims and Hindus is something that deeply upsets the Daji, the Daji, one of the key dramat dramatis personae. Why are I can't with all the languages right now um, in Immaculate Conception. Okay, etc, etc. Okay, that gives you context of the film. I do ap sincerely apologize for like mispronunciation. For mispronunciation. I can't, I couldn't even pronounce <laughs> mispronunciation. Yes, I know that this will also be, a I say also, I'm kind of referencing things from other videos that I've already recorded, but I know this will also be something that I end up doing a lot of research on and diving into the supplements. So I'm glad that I I don't, again, I don't know if the supplements differ from limited to standard editions, but I'm glad that I have the limited edition here to have more context, hopefully, maybe, perhaps. And then the last film that I got from Indicator is The Lonely Passion of Judith Hearn, directed by Jack Clayton, starring Maggie Smith, Bob Hoskins, and Wendy Hiller. This is Region B, limited edition, um, and I just, I started watching the trailer, it's from, by the way, did I tell you the year of this? This says 1992. Immaculate Conception is from 1992. The Lonely Passion of Judith Hearn is from 1987. It's a UK film. I started watching the trailer for this and it was just giving me, <laughs> it was giving me Stanley and Iris vibes. That was a film that I watched on the Criterion. No, it wasn't Criterion Channel. It was on TCM in August on the day that they were showing a bunch of uh, Jane Fonda films and because that was sort of like an unconventional sort of an unconventional relationship and this sort of seems along that line as well um, but also it reminded me of Mermaids only because of Bob Hoskins and I really like Bob Hoskins at least in, in Mermaids I can't think of other things that I've seen him in but I just already could tell from the trailer. I didn't finish watching the trailer. I exited. I was like, I'm going to cry in this film and I'm, it's going to be like a heartwarming film. I can tell. Hopefully it could be heartbreaking as well, but I also think it'll be like, oh, so cute and sentimental. <laughs> I do know that this is based on a book though, and it is available. So that is on my wish list and kind of higher up on the list now in terms of things that I'm buying. An unlikely relationship based on love, faith, and a little deception. Oh, I knew that religion had someone to, has somewhat to do with it. In the trailer that I watched, Maggie Smith, who plays Jude, I'm assuming that's Judith, she asks Bob, Bob's character about uh, going to church. And I think that's something that they're going to end up doing together pretty often throughout the film. Again, unlikely relationship. I love, I love unconventional and unlikely relationships in, in stories in general, like books, film, television, whatever. Um, it could also be, you know, obviously <laughs> I don't, I'm not endorsing such relationships, but it could be legal or illegal, you know, that sort of, those sort of complex, complex relationships, I guess. I feel like because usually when I say I love unconventional relationships, I immediately think of like The Graduate, Lolita, and those are the two that immediately come to mind. And obviously I, I don't condone things like Lolita. Like, it's literally about a pedophile. Still, one of my favorite books. And that's, yes, that's all I know about this unconventional relationship. Seems so sweet, hopefully. <laughs> uh, I don't like the other artwork for this. But it's there as an option. Oh, you know what? I also forgot. Immaculate Conception is by number 145 and... The Lonely Passion of Judith Hearn is by number 123. Oh, the back of this says, Things are going to be better here than the other places. I feel it. A new start, I promise. What does that mean? So I have a lot of things to say for the next five films, so I should really get on with it. I do want to say really quickly, so some of these are from Best Buy and some of these are from Target. I do just want to mention, though, that Target recently, I don't know how often they do it, but recently they have been having a buy two get one free sale. They had one in October and that's when I bought a couple of these movies and they also have had like one this month. Actually one is currently happening. 
And I don't think it's just because of Black Friday weekend. I think it really was just a promotion that they were having again. Buy two, get one free on movies and books is what they've been doing. They also do have Criterion titles available online, even though they price it at like 27 or $28. If you're getting three Criterions, you know, around the same price, say one's $27, one is $28, another one is $27, that's like... $55 for three Criterions, you know? So just to let you know, if you, if you know, you can't participate in a sale, in a Barnes & Noble sale or a flash sale, but you still want to get titles at some point, check Target sometimes. I add things to my wish list and then I'll usually get an email that's like, hey, what are the things in your wish list? There's a, there's a promotion going on um, for it. That was bad wording, but you get what I mean. Also, another thing, by the way, <laughs> um, tips for Criterion buying, I guess, is this section of the video. Though, granted, I don't know how much Target really has in terms of the what, what they have online for Criterions. The thing that I wanted to say pertaining to Barnes & Noble is that um, I saw recently, twice this month, they've had a promotion for if you buy a gift card that's at least $100, they will also send you a $10 gift certificate for free. So I actually did that. I got a few books I was going to make an order and then I saw that it was like get at least $100 gift certificate and get $10, also get $10 um, for free. They, they'll send that later on. Um, you have to look at like the details for the promotion, but if you Obviously, that's like a free 10, that's a free $10. <laughs> so if you are, you know, doing a lot of Criterion shopping or something like that, and obviously gift certificates don't expire, so you can get those in advance and then have some extra $10 gift certificates to use towards Criterion sales and such. I do think that if you want more than one $10 gift certificate, you have to sort of make separate orders, perhaps using different email addresses. Again, you'll have to look at the promotional details, but if you use one email address and if you use two different email addresses and did $100 gift certificates for each email address, then that's $220. That's a free, that's basically a free criterion during a criterion sale at Barnes & Noble. You get my point. Okay, moving on to the titles that I got randomly. Let's, let's start with the miscellaneous one here. The one that stands out the most here is Little Women, the 2019 adaptation. I just really felt like watching this again. I did realize that it's actually on Stars, but it's okay because this also has supplements and it was only like $10. And it was only like $10. And I think I, this is one of the free items that I got from Target because this is one of the things that I got from the Target sale. I got seven books and two movies. <laughs> And I saved like 50 to $60. Oh yeah, that's another thing. Okay, not to, not to just keep going on about this, but the Target sales are actually really good because I was sort of, when I was making my order, I was like thinking about it in terms of groups. I had like three items that were like 20 to $25, three more items that were 20 to $25, and three more items that were um, between 10 and $15. Um, and obviously it's buy, buy two, get one free. So that's why I was kind of thinking of it like that. I already made, I made the order. And then I realized afterwards, I was like, wait a second. They didn't even just put all the three lowest price items as the free items. They actually did kind of keep it as, okay, she has six items essentially that are around 20 to $25. So two of those will be free. And then one of the other 10 to $15 priced items will be free as well. Like I could have saved only $30, but instead I, I, I saved like 50 to $60. I'm a little distracted right now. Um, I, I just noticed that my battery is low. So we have to continue. Great, great on Target's behalf. Thank you Target for helping me save money. So Little Women, the 2019 adaptation. I kind of thought this was just okay. <laughs> um, I know people love it, but I really love the 1994 adaptation. And there were things about this that bothered me. I am one of those people that's like, the historical costuming is not, <laughs> is not what I want it to be. Where are the bonnets? <laughs> um, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll leave some videos in the card and description talking about how like a, a few things. Okay. One is, is like, where are the bonnets? What 
what are they going for with the styling here but also I recently rewatched um I can't think of her name but I re I recently rewatched another sort of um historical drama um historical costuming sorry video that talks about the sort of thing that has been more apparent in recent adaptations of things especially pertaining to like female characters where it's sort of the I'm not like the other girls kind of trope tro if you can call it a trope in historical dramas and this is sort of one of an example of of that because they have Joe be very like sort of masculine in a way I mean, I'll, I'll have to link the video I can't go on because I just my battery's low and I have like four more movies to talk about but I really want to re-watch this and give it like another shot especially without like it's been I haven't seen this since it came out in theaters I haven't re-watched the 94 adaptation I don't think since around this time as well and obviously it's been a number of years since I read the book so I kind of want to clean slate it and see, even though I am, I'll, I'll be going in a little biased, obviously, but I want to give it another shot and watch all the special features and maybe listen to the, is there, if there's an audio commentary, I would love to listen to the audio commentary. And then I will go on to, I think everyone knows what Little Women is. I realize I did not go into the synopsis, but you probably know what it's about. Uh, it's about the March sisters, uh, the March family living in sort of Civil War era America, just them, the sisters growing up. It's about, it's about the sisters, basically. Um, and then I will mention now The Legend of Hell House. This, I wanted to rewatch this. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I wanted to rewatch this, so I got it. This is also the Scream Factory release, which I didn't know when I bought it. I just knew that I wanted to get the movie. I had been thinking about it for some reason. I don't know, I'm probably just thinking about Haunted House Stories and wanted to rewatch it because it has been a number of years since I watched it for the first time. But then also I found on YouTube the audiobook for Hell House by Richard Matheson. Um, and so I listened to that. It was fantastic. Oh my god, I will have to link the my Goodreads review for the book, the audiobook, in the description. And I'll also link my review for the movie as well because I, I did like it, but man, the audiobook was so good. Uh, it was a lot more vulgar than I thought it would be and much more vulgar than the film. I'd actually really like to see a remake of or like another adaptation of Hell House because I think it could be really well done nowadays and could actually be like really accurate to like not toned down at all where this sort of is. And then we have some vampire movies. I will start with Dracula the 25th anniversary edition. This is the 4k UHD title. This is my second 4k title. Um, it also comes with a blu-ray though so that's a plus for me because I don't have a 4k player in here and technically this is the first 4k a disc that I bought because I got Wreck-It Ralph on 4k for free. So anyway, Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula, directed by Francis Ford Coppola from 1992. The Legend of Hell House is from 1973. Uh, direct, sorry, directed by, directed by John Hugh. Ho? Huh? Huff? Huff. It's probably Huff. H-O-U-G-H. Yes, and Bram Stoker's Dracula. Oh my gosh. This is a rewatch for me, but like, I, oh my god, this sucks that my, my battery is low. <laughs> Maybe I should go get my charger. Should I go get my charger? Well, it'll tell me when like, I'm at like 10%. I'm at like 15% right now. Okay, well, man, these supplements for this really helped me to appreciate this even more. Like, I, I already really liked the film, and Dracula is one of my favorite books, so I'm kind of biased anyway to really liking the story no matter what, and Winona Ryder is one of my favorites. So rewatching this was great, but also all the supplements on this, there's like so much. There's an audio comment. Oh, I don't think I watched it again with the audio commentary, but there's lots of interviews with Francis Ford Coppola and other, just all the people, most of the people involved in the film. Um, there's deleted and extended scenes. Uh, literally that's all it says in terms of the special features on the back, but it just says like, and more exclamation point. And it goes into so much of the making of the film. Like, just every- literally everything, okay? Everything that you could possibly want to know about the production of Dracula. And one of my favorite things about this is that 
it's all practical. There's no CGI used and Francis Ford Coppola was really adamant about that. He fired a couple of the people who wanted, who was like, wanted to use CGI. <laughs> He's like, no, that's exactly what I don't want. You're fired. And they used a lot of tricks that were used in early silent films, particularly the guy who did the trip a trip to the moon whose name I feel like I mispronounce and I because I, I in my head I can't figure out where the eyes and the e's are George Melies George Melies anyway he was like his sort of techniques were an inspiration and sort of like used on the film so much actually a lot of the features that I think are are available on YouTube I could try to find them but I really recommend getting the movie physically and having all the supplements and stuff and then more vampires interview with the vampire and queen of the damned all right mixed bag here <laughs> because i love interview with the vampire i just i had to get this movie it's one of my favorite books it's one of my favorite movies and i had wanted my brother to watch it with me um he like expressed interest when i was reading i was reading was i reading queen of the damned or had i just finished it i don't remember but he was like, that's based on a book? And I was like, yeah. And then somehow I got into Interview with the Vampire. And he's like, wait, what? And I was like, yeah, it's part of the same series. Which he didn't know before. And now he knows. And he watched both of these with me. This was a rewatch for me. I already said it's a favorite of mine. It's about, oh, also, like, it's Dracula. I don't think I need to tell you what Dracula is about. But um, an Interview with the Vampire is about Louis who becomes a vampire, um, and Lestat, the, the vampire Lestat, is his sire. Louis is his fledgling. That's what they call it in the uh, Vampire Chronicles world. And it's just the, the two of them being vampires. <laughs> like, it's kind of hard to explain what this is. Uh, well, okay, it is, it's, interview with a vampire. So Louis is telling his story about how he became a vampire and his life as a vampire um, with Lestat. And then also they make a child vampire, Claudia, played by Kirsten Dunst, who is so good in this movie. She's another one of my favorite actresses. I just have a lot of favorites, okay? Tom Cruise plays Lestat and Brad Pitt plays Louis. Um, Christian Slater plays the interviewer, who was actually supposed to be played by River Phoenix, but then he died, so he was unable to play the interviewer, obviously, uh, which is why the film is dedicated to River Phoenix. River Phoenix is another one of my favorites, if you didn't know. They make the child vampire Claudia and more. Oh, man, I love, I just love Interview so much because I think a lot of it comes from just like understanding and appreciating the impact the Vampire Chronicles, specifically Interview with the Vampire Maid, like Anne Rice is the blueprint for vampire stories that we have nowadays. So many vampire stories have the archetypes of, are like from the archetypes of um, Lestat and Louis as characters. I started watching the Vampire Diaries at the same time that I was reading Interview with the Vampire. And I was like, wait a second, <laughs> Damon and Stefan are just Lestat and Louis. And then I was like, wait a second, Angel and Spike are also just Louis and Lestat. And wait a second, Eric and Bill are just Lestat and Louis. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm saying the names respectively, but I can't think of like the characters' names immediately. So sorry that it was like kind of mixed, but you get my point. There's always some sort, not always, but often, there is the chaotic vampire who was just living it up as a vampire, and that is Lestat, and then there's the existential brooding vampire who is, you know, Louis. And Louis is just so miserable. Um, he actually is not even that miserable in the film. He's much worse, much more miserable in the book, because he has, like, his his humanity has somehow stayed with him even though he's been turned into a vampire. And he's like, what is the meaning of being a vampire? How can this be it? We must, we must have more. <laughs> I just, I love it so much. I could really, I could continue, but I should move on uh, to this very questionable movie, Queen of the Damned. I don't even know where to begin with this. I mean, I knew it wasn't going to be great. And it was enjoyable to an extent where like my brother and I were kind of like, 
what's happening here? And I just kept on telling him things that happened in the books because this is indeed based on two of the books. Why? I don't know. The second book in the Vampire Chronicles is the Vampire Lestat and then the third book is the Queen of the Dam. I don't know. I just have... <laughs> I'll leave like review if for any of the films that I'm talking about if I have a review I will link a my letterbox review in the description. Aaliyah was like the best part of this. Oh my gosh, she understood Akasha. I don't know. Th the thing is my favorite parts about my favorite parts about the Vampire Lestat the book and the Queen of the Damned the book are learning about Lestat and how he came to be a vampire and just, you know, that that whole thing <laughs> his backstory and then in the queen of the damned the backstory of how vampires came to be um you in that book it's explained how like akasha and uncle uncle i can't say it very well i think it's a is it a or e i don't i listen to the audiobook so i don't know like the names how they're spelled i think it's e-n-k-e-l it's not gonna i don't think he's barely a character in this um because they just really make it all about akasha and lestat which i get it's 90 minutes and those are ginormous books that they're they're squishing into one but anyway the the origin story of vampires that's my favorite part of the queen of the damned and all of that is just you don't need nothing it's not it's not in here it's not in here so it, things are like kind of explained but not really, oh man, I mean, there's so much, there's so much that I hoped for this and that I wanted to be in this, but that just makes me hopeful for the, hopefully, fingers crossed, hopefully everything will go well with the current, in, you know, it's, it's in development, the current, uh, Vampire Chronicles adaptation. <sighs> Which I cannot, I literally, I can't get into. Um, I know the cast, like, Louis and Lestat, the casting of those two um, characters have been announced. I know that Anne, Anne Rice has been, like, trying to get a good adaptation of her books off the ground. Things have been in the works for years. Her son, Christopher Rice, is also working on stuff. They're both executive producers, I'm pretty sure. I don't know how much they're involved with the writing. Anne Rice is so controlling over her property which understandably so but i do think that she probably gave up some limer liberties in order for the show to even happen because it is something that she's like really passionate about you can tell but she still wants it to be her stories and her characters um i will actually link alisa 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 oh my god i'm so bad with names today i'm so sorry um maven of the eventide her video that she did earlier this year when casting was announced, um, she was talking about the Vampire Chronicles. Uh, she's a longtime Vampire Chronicles fan, and she does videos pertaining to all things vampires. Yeah, she's great. And I will leave that video in the description and, and the card. I, I, I might have a limit to how many videos I can put in the card. I think it's only like three or four. But anyway, I'll link that in the description if you are interested in knowing about the in production, in development, uh, Vampire Chronicles adaptation. And I have to get my charger so that I can film the next video. So, um, thank you for watching. Tell me, like, do you know about these movies? Have you seen them? Do you like them? Etc. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!